My sub second topic with you this evening deals with the probably benign lesions, how they are defined, evaluated, and managed, and the data in support of this concept. If I again go back to the BIRADS atlas that I talked to you about earlier, the fifth edition published in 2013, there are assessment categories that are provided for mammographic studies, for ultrasound, and for breast MRI. Most of what I'm gonna talk about this evening deals with the concept of the probably benign lesion as it applies to mammography. I'll say a few words at the very end with respect to ultrasound findings. I will not be talking about probably benign lesions in MR at all. With respect to screening mammograms, we have basically three BIRADs that we routinely use. The BIRAD zero is a BIRAD where the patient needs additional evaluation. So she's asked to return for those studies or if we're requesting prior studies for comparison. BIRADS one is assigned to the screening mammograms that are negative. BIRADS two is given to screening mammograms that have benign findings. And these patients are actually returned to annual screening mammography. Again, I wanna emphasize that these are the only three BIRADS categories assigned on screening mammograms. Once we call a patient back, we have many other additional BIRADS categories available to us. The category three, I'm gonna spend the next 25 minutes or so discussing. The category four, the suspicious findings, and these can be further divide, subdivided into 4A, 4B, and 4C. Low suspicion for malignancy is 4A, where the likelihood of malignancy is greater than 2%, but less than or equal to 10%. The moderate suspicion for malignancy, greater than 10% likelihood, but less than or equal to 50%. And then category 4C, a high suspicion for malignancy is those lesions that have a greater than 50% chance, but less than 95% 95% chance of malignancy. And the category five is assigned to the highly suggestive of malignancy greater than or equal to 95%. And the category six really is not typically used on screening mammograms. It's those patients in whom a biopsy is already proven a malignancy and they're either getting hormonal therapy, for example, or they're getting neoadjuvant therapy. What we're really gonna concentrate on this evening are the category three probable benign lesions where short interval follow-up is recommended. In these lesions, the likelihood of malignancy is greater than 0%, but less than or equal to 2%. Please keep in mind that this concept was described, defined in the longitudinal data in support of its use is applicable to mammographic findings, not ultrasound, not breast MRI. And the two major papers that supported and provided the longitudinal data uh, in support of the use were published in 1991 by Dr. Sickles and in 1992 by Drs. Varis, Laborn, and Laborn. And it is these two papers that form the basis for the development of this probably benign lesion concept. The premise that these authors investigated is they wanted to show that if they selected lesions in a very specific way, they had to be lesions that could be easily classified. They had a low likelihood of malignancy. They weren't going to be following cancers, in other words. Surveillance or follow-up would demonstrate a change with these lesions. And at the point at which the cancers were diagnosed, they still needed to be an early stage. In order for this concept to work, you need to have cancers that are diagnosed at early stages. And so in Dr. Sickle's paper, he defined localized findings, which included a cluster of calcifications, non-calcified, non-palpable masses that could have gentle ovulations, but circumscribed margins, non-palpable focal asymmetry, and he had a miscellaneous category. And then the multiple similar findings randomly distributed bilaterally included multiple masses, multiple clusters of calcifications, and diffuse calcifications. Dr. Varis and her colleagues focused more on localized findings, such as clusters of round calcifications, 
a mass with circumscribed margins or non-palpable focal asymmetry. The stage of cancers that these investigators reported for their patients, for Dr. Sickles, there were 17 cancers identified in his population of probably benign lesions. 12% had DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ. Two of the 17 patients had positive lymph nodes at the time of diagnosis, but 17 of the 17 patients were stage zero or stage one breast cancers. Dr. Varis reported 22% DCIS patients. 22 of the patients in her study, two of, 19, of nine had positive lymph nodes. And interestingly enough, one patient with a T1N0 lesion had distant metastatic disease at the time of a breast cancer diagnosis. Dr. Sickles followed up in 1994 uh, with describing non-palpable circumscribed, non-calcified breast masses could be managed with periodic mammographic surveillance regardless of the lesion size or the age of the patient. It was really the imaging characteristics that enabled you to safely follow these patients. In 1995, he provided updated data, which basically said for solid masses with circumscribed margins, 1.4% would have breast cancer. Focal asymmetric density, the likelihood of malignancy was 0.6%. And for localized microcalcifications, it was 0.4%. Now it is important to emphasize, and I'm gonna say this several times, that the BIRATS category three is not used on screening studies. We characterize the lesions before we classify them as probably benign. And the characterization of the lesion might involve additional mammographic views. It might involve tomosynthesis if that was not initially done. It may require an ultrasound study of the lesion. And usually if we do ultrasound, we're also doing a physical examination at the time of the ultrasound. Now you might say, well, why do the additional evaluation? Why is it needed before you uh, can use the BIRATS category three? Why not just take the lesion that you see in a screening mammogram and assign it into that category? Well, the additional views and the additional studies increase your confidence in the appropriate recommendation. It helps justify and support your decision to follow the lesion rather than to do a biopsy. It also eliminates lesions that with additional evaluation can be classified as benign. For example, a mass that turns out to be a cyst on ultrasound. It also helps identify lesions that need immediate biopsy you basically get additional information on the characteristics of the finding that might alter your final recommendation. So again, the BIRATS three lesions require complete characterization before usage of that BIRATS category. So for example, in this patient, I'm showing you a low to isodense mass. It has circumscribed margins probably benign by the mammographic description that I have given you. But when you bring the patient back and you do an ultrasound, you actually see a mass that is predominantly hypoechoic with an echogenic focus that's associated with it. And so now, as with the cyst, you can characterize this as a lymph node, a BIRATS2, a benign lesion, and you don't need to do any more additional follow-ups. You can provide the patient and the referring physician with reassurance that what was seen mammographically is in fact benign. Let me show you another example where we have a dense mammogram. It's a busy mammogram with benign scattered calcifications, but there's also a mass identified here. Is this a probably benign lesion? With what degree of certainty on these, on these images can you say whether this is probably benign or not? You bring the patient back, BIRAD zero, you do additional views. And now I ask you, what do you think? And with what degree of confidence can you say that this lesion needs to be biopsied? I would argue that this is a BIRADS 4C lesion where a biopsy is indicated today, not six months from now, the additional views give you the confidence, they give you the information you need to with certainty say that the likelihood of cancer is high in this patient and a biopsy is indicated. Let me give you another example 
just to illustrate the point of parenchymal asymmetry, which we talked about earlier. This is a patient that has an area of focal parenchymal asymmetry. Is this probably benign? And with what degree of certainty can you tell on these studies as to whether it should be a BioRADS 3 or whether something additional needs to be done? So we call this patient back if we have no prior films, if we have no history that would explain this, such as trauma, for example, or inflammatory findings on physical exam, this patient is called back for additional evaluation. She's a BIRAD zero. And when you do the spot compression views, I again ask you, what do you think? These are amazing in that they show you the speculation, the distortion of this tissue. There are actually associated calcifications that were even in retrospect, hard to see on the screening image. And so this becomes a BIRADS 4C lesion and the, a biopsy is indicated and done. And she's diagnosed with cancer at the same setting. Now, more recently in May of 2020, Dr. Berg and several other colleagues published a very interesting paper, and they basically describe mammographic lesions that have been appropriately validated as probably benign, include a solitary mass with circumscribed margin that appears solid on ultrasound, focal asymmetry that has no ultrasound correlate, or a group of punctate calcifications on magnification views. So here, for example, you have a mass it's macrolobulated, it has circumscribed margins. On ultrasound, it's solid. If there are no prior films, if this is the patient's first mammogram, this is a lesion that can safely be followed with a likelihood of malignancy of less than 2%. Focal parenchymal asymmetry on the spot compression views. Notice how the characteristics of those lesions change significantly between the two projections. There's no underlying mass, there's no distortion, there's no calcifications. The physical exam on this patient is normal and her ultrasound basically showed normal glandular tissue. This again falls into the probably benign category where we would recommend a six month follow-up. A cluster of calcifications, that has predominantly round. There are some punctate calcifications. These are spot compression views. There are uh, uh, basically no linear forms. There's no segmental distribution. This falls into the probably benign category that can be followed uh, with a six month follow-up. Now let's spend some time talking about what is an appropriate short interval follow-up. Is it three months? Is it four months? Is it six months? Six months? I would argue that these are probably benign lesions where at the very beginning we said the likelihood of malignancy is low. So if you have a lesion where you're expecting to see a change in three months or four months, I would submit that maybe you should consider doing a biopsy today. The exception to this rule is if you have a benign lesion that is going to evolve or resolve rapidly. So if you're suspecting trauma based on the patient's history, in other words, you're thinking it's fat necrosis, or again, because of the patient's symptoms or physical findings, you're considering an inflammatory process, then a three and a two month, a three month follow-up is completely appropriate. For all others, it is six months that is characterized as the short interval, six months. Now, what about six months versus 12 months? Should we even be doing that six months? Why not just follow the patient up 12 months later? You can argue from Dr. Sickle's original paper, only two of the 17 cancers that he found among the 3,184 patients he followed, two cancers were picked up at six months. So you could actually use his data to suggest that maybe that six month follow-up is not indicated. Most of his patients were picked up a year or two years out. Dr. Varis's paper is a little bit more difficult because they don't break them up into the six and 12 month follow-up that Dr. Sickles did. And they basically described three of nine patients with the, with the cancers being diagnosed at six to 10 months. So, it is a, an important question to answer. And now I'm gonna to return to Dr. Berg's patient, uh, Dr. Berg's 
publication in radiology in 2020, in May of 2020, where they looked at the National Mammography Database, where they're collecting data from 471 facilities in the United States. In other words, it's academic practices, it's private practices. It is many radiologists looking at thousands of mammograms and using this BIRADS category. And between 2009 and 2018, they identified 45,202 women that were assigned into the probably benign category. And they go on to describe a cumulative cancer yield of 1.86 through two years of follow-up and 468 of the 810 malignancies, close to 60% of the malignancies were diagnosed within six months. If we look a little bit more into the staging, unfortunately, they only had staging on about half of the patients that were diagnosed with cancer. So they had staging in 428 of 810 patients. And in this, they had almost 33% DCISs. They had almost 77% minimal cancers and almost 87% were no negative invasive ductal carcinomas. 391 of the 428, in other words, 91% of the patients had stage zero or stage one disease. But interestingly enough, 19 of the 153 women or 12% diagnosed at six months had positive lymph nodes. So they in essence conclude that in the National Mammography Database, BIRADS category three use is appropriate with 1.86 cumulative cancer, year, uh, cancer yield through two years of follow-up of the 810 malignancies, 57.8% were diagnosed at or before six months validating the necessity of short interval follow-up of mammography BIRADS category three findings. There's an additional paper uh, published out of Boston University where they actually looked at 7,632 women with a BIRADS three designation. And they interestingly enough added an eight month, 18 months follow-up. And if you look, 197 of those 7,600 women were upstaged where a biopsy was recommended. 179 of the patients had biopsies and they identified 34 cancers. Interestingly enough, again, supporting the six month follow-up and the annual follow-up, 88.2% of the patients diagnosed were cancer were diagnosed within the first year only a fraction of patients were diagnosed at 18 months. And so consequently, these authors basically state that based on these results, six, 12 and 24th month follow-up protocol for BIRAS three lesions is sufficient. So in essence, what we're saying is that when you assign a lesion into the probably benign category, it has been evaluated. You have all the information you need on the lesion. You're only gonna do one extra study and it's usually a unilateral. Occasionally you might have a patient who has bilateral lesions, but most of these are unilaterals. So the patient has a screening mammogram, uh, say a week ago, you give it a BIRAD zero for additional evaluation. She has a diagnostic study today you determine that it is appropriate to categorize it as a BIRADS-3 lesion. So what you're gonna do is a unilateral study in six months. At that point, you can decide it's benign and down categorize her to a two, or you keep it as a category three, or potentially you put it into a BIRADS-4 because you think it needs biopsy. If you leave it as a BIRADS-3, the patient has a bilateral study in six months. And again, at that point, you decide whether you want to keep it as a BIRADS 3, whether you want to down the category to a 2, or whether you want to make it a BIRADS 4. If you keep it as a BIRADS 3, she returns for a bilateral study in 12 months. This is now 24 months after the original study. And most facilities at this point are no longer doing a follow-up for three months. After the 24 months, um, have transpired, the patient is returned to screening if the lesion is stable.
Now, please keep in mind that it's well enough for us to look at the images and decide that a patient can be safely followed. But if the patient is anxious, when I go in to talk to these women, if the minute I start to say we see something and we're gonna check it in six months, if the patient gets very upset, her mother died of breast cancer, or she's got a sister that's undergoing chemotherapy for breast cancer, obviously that patient is not gonna do well for six months. You're better off biopsying it today to give her the peace of mind. If you think the patient is not gonna come back for the six month follow-up, or if the patient is pregnant, then probably the patient is better served from having a biopsy today rather than undergoing six month follow-up. Please, please vigilantly audit the frequency of use. Just like you audit your results for the BIRADS four and five lesions, you should periodically be checking and asking of the screening mammograms or the diagnostic mammograms, what percentage of screening, if you have any, you need to eliminate those. On the diagnostic mammogram, what percentage of the BIRADS, of BIRADS three am I assigning? Because that percentage should be low and you should do the audit by individual radiologists as well as by practice. You don't wanna use this category to delay or avoid making a decision today. And you don't wanna use this category to do incomplete workups today. Fully evaluate the lesion and then assign it the category appropriately. I wanna just share with you uh, Dr. Rosen when he was at Duke and his colleagues there published a very interesting paper in 2002 where they looked at 51 malignant lesions among 178 that had been assigned to the probably benign category. Almost half of these were calcifications. You had about 24% masses and asymmetric densities and 4% architectural distortion, which really does never belongs in the probably benign category. And he found that in these 51 malignant lesions, none of them fulfilled the published criteria for probably benign findings. And the most common reason for exclusion was that 92% of the lesions had already demonstrated progression. So they go on to conclude that placement of a lesion into the probably benign category is a poor substitute for incomplete or suboptimal diagnostic evaluation. And they state that common failures encountered in reviewing the diagnostic evaluations performed on the malignancies in our studies were degraded by image blur on the magnification views, inaccurate or incomplete localization of the lesion and failure to assess interval progression. So for example, this patient here, this lesion here, is this really a probably benign finding? First of all, it's palpable. That's why the metallic BB is there. Are the margins circumscribed? Absolutely not. If you look at the ultrasound, this is not a probably benign lesion on ultrasound. Notice the margins, notice the little spicules on the margins of this. And yet this was classified as a probably benign lesion. And six months later, this is what the patient's ultrasound looked like. So you have to be meticulous in your characterization of the lesion. Make sure that you fully evaluate it before you place patients into this category. And really I would submit to you that with respect to the BIRADS category, this should be limited almost exclusively to those women that have no prior studies. In other words, if you have a new mass that is solid on ultrasound, it's new compared to a prior study, why would you want to put it into the probably benign category? But I would argue biopsy is indicated today. You have a new solid mass, the older the patient, the greater the likelihood of malignancy. If the finding is stable compared to last year, or if it's getting smaller, what is six months gonna do for you? And if the finding is getting bigger compared to a year ago, there is no use for doing a six month follow-up. So in our practice, the use of the probably benign lesion is almost exclusively limited to patients who have no prior studies. Now, what about the concept for ultrasound studies. And as I said, I'm not gonna say anything about MRI lesions. We routinely use it with ultrasound, but we need to recognize that the longitudinal data in support of this concept is only available for mammographic studies. Again, if we 
If I quote you the ultrasound section in the BIRADS Atlas, the assessment three probably benign, it's not an indeterminate category for you simply when the radiologist is unsure whether to render a benign BIRADS two or suspicious BIRADS four assessment, but one that is reserved for specific imaging findings known to have greater than 0%, but less than or equal to 2% likelihood of malignancy. For ultrasound, there is robust evidence that a solid mass with circumscribed margins, oval shape, parallel orientation, and an isolated complicated cyst have a likelihood of malignancy in the defined less than or equal to 2% probably benign range for which a short interval follow-up sonogram is indicated. So lesions like this on ultrasound, where it's horizontal, horizontally oriented, has circumscribed margins, it's hypoechoic. And here again, a horizontally oriented lesion with circumscribed margins. If you're doing screening ultrasound, it is this type of lesion here that's appropriately followed at six month interval, uh, at a six month interval if you have no prior studies. A simple cyst, lots of posterior acoustic enhancement, uh, circumscribed margins in comparison with a complicated cyst, where if you wanted to, uh, if you don't have the comfort level to call this a BIRADS 2, you can certainly do a BIRADS 3, probably benign, or complicated cysts that look like this, where you have an abrupt interface. This is what I call the yin yang uh, sign. These are complicated cysts. If you want to put a needle in these, you'll often watch these claps under ultrasound guidance and completely disappear. So it is this type of lesion that if you want it to follow as probably benign, you could. All other lesions, you, if you assign it a probably, uh, a probably benign category, uh, you're probably out there on your own because there's no data in support of it. The Breast ultrasound section goes on to say that similar data have been reported for the clustered microcyst, but these data are less strong because they involve many fewer cases. The use of assessment three for sonographic findings, other than these three, the solid mass that's circumscribed margins horizontally oriented, the complicated cysts and the microcyst, should be considered only if the radiologist has personal experience to justify a watchful waiting approach, preferably involving observation of a sufficient number of cases of an additional ultrasound finding to suggest the likelihood of malignancy within the defined less than 2% probably benign range. And this is an example here of clustered microcysts, these little tiny cystic spaces with very thin septations. Here's another example where you have these tiny, it's basically a cluster of microcysts here with tissue harmonics. You can also put these into the BIRADS category three, provided that you're comfortable that these are in fact clustered microcysts. Now beware, because the other thing that is worrying me a little bit is that is what I call the short interval follow-up creep. In other words, thinking that 4A lesions can be put into the probably benign category. I have just described to you the data that supports the BIRADS3 lesions. I have described and shown you examples for what these lesions look like. If you assign something to a BIRADS4, that requires tissue diagnosis. It is not appropriate to do short-term follow-up on the BIRADS 4A lesions. Likewise, if you assign something to the BIRADS category three, the patient may elect to have a biopsy. She may decide that she wants to know for sure, or the referring physician may say, I really want this biopsy since those fulfill the criteria and since you're recommending short-term follow-up, you should leave those as a category three, even though a biopsy is being done. In other words, don't upstage the lesion because that's going to make your numbers look, uh, it's going to lower what your 4A means, the percentage, the likelihood of malignancy. So if it's a BIRADS3 lesion, I leave it in that category, even though the patient may ask me to do a biopsy. In other words, my recommendation to the patient is a short interval follow-up. I discuss biopsy, and if she elects to have a biopsy, I still leave it as a BIRADS3 category.
So in summary, the primary use of this category in our practice, lesions are placed in this category after complete workups, spot compression, spot magnification, tomosynthesis, physical exam, and or ultrasound when we have no prior studies or occasionally where we have been unable to locate the patient's prior films. It's a solid mass with circumscribed margins, no prior films. Focal parenchymal asymmetry with a normal physical exam and ultrasound and a group of calcifications that are round and punctate with no linear forms. Six month follow-up or a short interval follow-up is a little less than a year, if you will, just because with this category, the likelihood of malignancy is quite a bit lower than 2%. Beware when using a woman with prior studies. Once you have prior studies, I think you need to make a decision as to what needs to happen with the patient today. My heartfelt thanks to all of you. Again, thank you, Rasha. Thank you, Merit, for inviting me. And I wish you all the very best. And please, please, in these difficult times, stay safe.